Greetings, one and all. When you look back over the history of the National Hockey League, most fans will have some sort of knowledge about many key parts of the NHL's history and how it helped to shape the league that we all watch and enjoy today. Key moments like the 1967 expansion, the expansion in the 2000s, the lockouts and the original six era are all key parts of the league's history and have been big talking points in the years that have followed each event. The original six era, consisting of the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Boston Bruins, the Detroit Red Wings, the New York Rangers and the Chicago Blackhawks, is often remembered as the era that started it all and has become known as the era that helped to popularise the game of hockey in North America and Canada. But what if I told you that there was a team in America before the Chicago Blackhawks or the Detroit Red Wings and even before the original six era? What if I told you that there was an NHL team playing in Madison Square Garden before the New York Rangers ever took to the ice? Well, there was, and in this video I'm going to teach you all about them. So get ready for a hockey history lesson, ladies and gentlemen, as I tell you about the Brooklyn Americans, New York's forgotten NHL franchise. The story begins in the year 1923, when the NHL consisted of only four teams the original Ottawa Senators, the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto St. Pats, and the Hamilton Tigers. Thomas Duggan, a sports promoter with an interest in hockey, received three options for NHL franchises in the United States, as the NHL wished to expand into the land of the free and the home of the brave. After selling the first option to Charles Adams, a Boston grocery magnate who went on to create the Boston Bruins in 1924, Duggan arranged for the second option to be given to Tex Rickard to have a team play in New York's Madison Square Garden. Rickard agreed to the idea, but his team weren't able to join the league straight away as the new Madison Square Garden, which would be the team's home arena, was being built. So the team was put on hold until the construction was finished in 1925. With the third option, Duggan decided to team up with Bill Dwyer, New York City's most celebrated bootlegger during the Prohibition, and create another franchise to play in New York. For those of you unaware, the prohibition took place between 1920 and 1933, and saw the US government ban the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol. Basically, alcohol became illegal, and the mafia or other crime bosses, such as Bill Dwyer, sold alcohol illegally for a really high price, because people still wanted to buy it even though it was illegal. It's a massive topic that we can't fit in this video, but I thought I'd make sure we were all on the same page. Back to the video. So Dwyer got the third and final NHL team and started work on setting up an NHL team in New York. The first problem he ran into was a shortage of players for the team. However, fortunately for him, the Hamilton Tigers, an already established NHL team who had finished first in the league the season prior, had been suspended by the league after the players went on strike for higher pay. Having their suspension quietly lifted in the off-season, Dwyer bought the collective rights to the Tigers roster for $75,000 and gave the players large raises to their salary in order to keep them happy and willing to play. Some players even earned double their paycheck from the previous season. Talk about a payday! So Dwyer had the permission for the team and he had the players. Now he just needed a name. Just before the 1925-26 season began, Dwyer announced that the team would be known as the New York Americans. The Americans, along with the Pittsburgh Pirates who joined the NHL that season also, became the second and third American-based teams in NHL history, behind the Boston Bruins, who joined the league the previous season. Whilst everything was sorted off the ice for the New York Americans, their play on the ice was another story. Success didn't come easy for the team, who finished 5th place in their inaugural season, with a record of 12 wins, 22 losses and 4 ties. However, they were a success at the box office and with the fans who kept coming back to watch their games. They were so successful that when MSG landed a team of their own in the New York Rangers, thanks to Tex Rickard, remember him, the Americans were forced to endorse the creation of this team. This was due to a clause in the American's lease requiring the team to support any bid for the Garden to acquire an NHL franchise, even though the Americans were already playing at MSG at the time. This inability to break their contract meant that the New York Americans would quickly become New York's second favourite hockey team, and thus began the chain reaction of the New York Americans' downfall. 
The struggles continued for the Americans both on and off the ice, as the team finished with a 17-25-2 record for the 1926-27 season and dropped to last in their division and ninth overall in the 1927-28 season with an 11-27-6 record. The New York Rangers, on the other hand, had won their division in 26-27 and won the Stanley Cup in 27-28, their sophomore season in the league. The 1928-29 season saw some well-deserved improvement for the Americans as they finished second in their division with a 19-13-12 record. This was largely due to the team signing star goalie Roy Waters from the Pittsburgh Pirates. Waters had a 1.21 goals against average and became the first goaltender in league history to win the Hart Memorial Trophy for league MVP for his efforts in leading the Americans to the playoffs for the first time in franchise history. However, the Americans were beaten in the playoffs by none other than the New York Rangers and their dreams of winning a Stanley Cup quickly vanished that season. The 1929-30 season saw more of what Americans fans were used to. The team dropped to 5th place in the division with a 14-25-5 record. Waters followed his stellar season with an awful one, finishing the year with a 3.75 goals against average as the Americans missed the playoffs again. However, Waters looked better for the 1930-31 season as he finished the year with a 1.68 goals against average and the Americans had a record of 18-16-10 but they missed out on the playoffs yet again due to the Montreal Maroons having two more wins than them, beating them in the tiebreak. The 1931-32 season was another bad year for the team as they finished last in their division with a 16-24-8 record and missed the playoffs once again. The main problems, however, came off the ice. With the end of Prohibition, Dwyer's services as a bootlegger were no longer needed as alcohol was freely available and legal again. This meant that Dwyer's income was massively reduced due to low demand of his services and he was struggling to make ends meet. The 1932-33 season saw more of the same, a 15-22-11 record and no playoffs for the team yet again. The 1933-34 season saw the team miss the playoffs for the fifth straight year, having a record of 15-23-10. It was at this point that Dwyer tried to merge the team with the Ottawa Senators, another team that was strapped for cash. However, the Board of Governors turned down the deal. This helped to further spell the downfall of two different NHL teams, as the Ottawa Senators didn't last much longer in the league until their revival in the 2000s. During the 1935-36 season, Dwyer decided to sell the New York Americans as he simply didn't have the money to keep it going himself. That year saw the team make the playoffs for the first time in six years, with a 16-25-7 record and an Americans player being the top scorer in the league by the name of Sweeney Schreiner. But the team bowed out in the second round of the playoffs against the Toronto Maple Leafs. No buyers came forward for the team even after this rebound season and a visit to the playoffs, so Dwyer abandoned the team. The NHL announced a takeover of the team for the next season, prompting Dwyer to sue the NHL, saying that they had no authority to do this. A settlement was reached where Dwyer could resume control of the team, provided he could pay off the team's debts by the end of the season. When the time came, Dwyer couldn't do so, and the NHL took control of the franchise. The team fared no better on the ice when the NHL took over and handed control to player coach Red Dutton, finishing with a 15-29-4 record in the 1936-37 season. But Sweeney Schreiner was once again the league's top scorer, so there was a diamond in the rough. The 1937-38 season saw the signings of Ching Johnson and Hap Day, along with the acquisition of goaltender Earl Robertson, which helped the team to a 19-18-11 record and a trip to the playoffs once again, but the Americans were beaten in the second round once again, this time by the Chicago Blackhawks. The Americans made the playoffs for the next two seasons, but were eliminated in the first round each year. However, an unexpected yet massive blow came to the team when Canada entered World War II in September of 1939. Many Canadian players left immediately for military service, with a larger number going during the 1940-41 season. During that season, the Americans had their worst season ever with an 8-29-11 record. 
Add to that the fact that the owner of the team, Red Dutton, was having to sell his best players for cash to pay off the debt from the Dwyer era, and it was clear that the New York Americans were on life support, and the clock was ticking ever faster. Then came the 1941-42 season, where Dutton renamed the team from the New York Americans to the Brooklyn Americans. Dutton had intended to move the team to Brooklyn, but there was no suitable arena in the area. So the Americans continued to play their games at Madison Square Garden, but would practice in Brooklyn. The team had yet another tough season, finishing with a 16-29-3 record. So the team suspended operations until the end of the Second World War, as they simply couldn't keep going due to the loss of players due to the war and the debt the team had amassed. In 1945, after the Second World War's conclusion, a group emerged willing to build an arena in Brooklyn for the team. But in 1946, the National Hockey League went back on their promise to reinstate the Americans and cancelled the franchise. To this day, NHL records list the Brooklyn Americans as having retired from the league in 1942. Thus ended the Brooklyn Americans franchise and its tenure in the National Hockey League. From bootleg beginnings to a bitter end, the Americans were a team that saw struggles and controversy both on and off the ice in their 19 years of existence in the NHL. During the span, the team made the playoffs four times, never getting past the second round and finishing with a regular season record of 255 wins, 402 losses and 127 ties. Whilst they were never the best team in the league and never won the Stanley Cup, the Brooklyn Americans' impact on the NHL is unprecedented. Having helped open the door to hockey in America and all the success that that has brought over the NHL's 100 years of existence, to creating iconic sporting traditions, such as being the first professional sports team to have the surname and number on each player's jersey, which the Americans started in the 1926-27 season. The Brooklyn Americans may have been forgotten by most of the hockey world, but their impact on the NHL as we know it today has stood the test of time. And there you go. What do you think about the rise and fall of New York's forgotten NHL franchise? Also, what do you think about me doing more videos concentrating on the history of NHL franchises long gone and long forgotten? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.